Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current iteration of my Sunday sermon. For many of you, 2020 has not been a good year. We've had pandemic, there have been um, um, protests around racism, there's been looting. Uh, there's been a lot going on, and a lot of people are pretty upset about it because their lives have been disrupted. A lot of other people are thinking, well, this maybe this is the end of the world. Maybe the world is coming to a screeching halt. Now, that's not an uncommon idea. And in fact, throughout most of recorded time, people have had a sense of impending doom. And in many ways, what we've been struggling through is fairly normal for life on planet Earth. We've had a pretty good 70-year run. The last major pandemic was was 1918 to 1920. It was sort of quickly forgotten because it was happened at the same time as the First World War, and then there was the Second World War, and there was the Cold War, and there have been a lot, a lot of things happening. So in many ways, the situation is normal in the world, yet, as I mentioned last week, there's there are various groups who have taken it upon themselves to try to save the world. Save the world from pandemic, from racism and sexism, from economic fears, of fears of environmental collapse. The world is falling apart. People are in constant strife, breaking out in violent, um, murderous violence. That's actually, if you read human history, it's pretty normal. Uh, smart, powerful, wealthy, famous, well-meaning people rise up to power to save the world. And the script almost always looks obvious to everyone. Let's elect a new leader. Let's put someone new in charge. Let's reform the government. Let's change politics and all will be well. And that's, in fact, between now and Election Day, vote for me and I'll make America great again or I'll restore America to normalcy or, or, or. This is the answer we get. The assumed path, even by non-politicians, always sort of seems the same. First, an individual has to become powerful. And throughout history, military might was the way that happened. You have a coup, and you violently overthrow the present regime and put your own people in charge, and they're going to make things right. And sometimes things are better, and sometimes things are worse. In democracy, we try to avoid this violence, but the attention sort of gets shifted over to fame and reputation and money. And in the age of mass media, gain control of the television and radio. And in social media, gain control of the zeitgeist and get everybody retweeting your favorite slogan. Once you, are, once you have fame and reputation or power and strength, then you can control and decree and make good laws and get the masses to do what you want. Augustine, writing towards the end of the Roman Empire, called this the libido dominandi, which means either the lust to dominate or a dominating lust. And he didn't mean it merely sexually. It often had a sexual element, but this was the assumed path to power. Now, it is noteworthy that the greatest world saver in human history, the one who shaped our moral assumptions more than anyone else, and whose moral assumptions in many ways have completely conquered our view of the world that human beings ought to be valued and cherished and loved. And anybody who says love is at the top of the value hierarchy in many ways got that idea from Jesus. No one in all of human history has changed the world more than he has. He wrote no book. He toppled no earthly government. He didn't become wealthy or even famous in his life. When you look at the amount of fame he had, let's say, on Palm Sunday in the triumphal entry, it was tiny compared to, let's say, the fame of Rome. And part of this led to the fact that you'll find very few books outside of Christianity that took much, paid much attention to him early on. Even Josephus, one of our principal sources away from it, mentions him only in passing. Yeah, look at him now. As we mentioned last week, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus tells his disciples, go, baptize, teach everyone to observe what I command. The Sermon on the Mount is in many ways the central corpus of the teachings of Jesus. And you see right away, as we looked at last week and in previous weeks, that the Beatitudes he gives are strange. 
the Beatitudes of the Psalms we would expect would be, Blessed are the righteous, for God will make their life good. And Jesus gives these strange upside-down Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. You see, very quickly, these things are applicable to today for many of us. Rejoice and be glad. Don't get even and bloody their nose. It's not what Jesus says. Because great is your reward in heaven. And those who don't believe in heaven say, Psh, what good is that? But you see, right away, Jesus' view seems strangely upside down, yet perennially alluring. At the same time, Jesus seems unreasonable, idealistic, and impractical. What you see in the next part of the sermon is that the sermon is highly participatory. You are the salt of the earth. Don't be unsalty salt. You are a city on the hill that can't be hidden. You are the light of the world. A light hidden is of no use to anyone else. And so right away, it isn't just Jesus. Jesus changes the world in many ways by changing us. And, well, will we get famous from this? Is this back to the assumed path? Jesus is clearly talking about world saving here, and his, and, and his followers are clearly crucial to the effort. You will be my witnesses, disciple, going, baptizing, teaching. You'll be given power by the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus goes into the law, and it's a very select use of the law. You know, he, you know you've heard it said, don't murder, but I say, watch your anger. You've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I say, watch your lust. And then he talks about divorce. Why would it make that list? And he talks about oath-taking and retaliation and loving your enemy. And he concludes it with an amazing statement that says, the perfection of God isn't simply in his moral purity, but is demonstrated in his generosity, even towards those who rebel against him. And, well, basically what he says that this is what you should be famous for, opposite of the libido dominandi, opposite of, I'm going to grab power and force goodness onto the world. Jesus says, what you will be famous for is, you're not even susceptible to anger. You're not even susceptible to lust. You're not divorcing. You're keeping your commitments. You're non-defensive. You're non-retaliatory. You love your enemies. The perfection that the God who sends the sun and the rain on the just and the unjust is known for. That's what you should be famous for. And so we think, oh, okay, now I get it. This will be the path to power. Fame and reputation by being morally more evolved than everyone else. That's our game A, remember? That's the assumed path. But then at the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do this, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So this is a warning, and it's a warning about righteousness. And right away we hear that word and we think, Well, I know what that means, but do we really? Dikaiosune is the Greek word. It comes from DK, which means a unified social and personal justice, correctness, and righteousness. But now you say, wait, I'm confused. I, I, I thought we were supposed to be salt of the earth, city on the hill, light of the world. I thought we were be supposed to be famous for these things. Well, yeah, that's true. But remember, this whole sermon is structured. And we looked at the structure last week. Everything is nested, sort of like a, a Russian eggs doll, an egg doll. And the Sermon on the Mount, the, the Lord's Prayer, is at the center of the sermon. And this is the next shell out. And the main message is, well, this is the righteousness before God that you must have. And be careful not to do it to be seen by others. Don't do it to stoke your reputation. Now let's talk about a little bit more about this word dikaiosune. Dallas Willard gives, I think, a really good practical treatment of it in his wonderful book on the Sermon on the Mount, The Divine Conspiracy. It is the, he says this is what the word is about. Now Dallas Willard 
taught philosophy at University of Southern California, California. And he was a Christian. And so he knows what he's saying both on the philosophical and the Christian front. It is the inner life of the soul that we must aim to transform. And then behavior will naturally and easily follow. Those behaviors we should be known for. But not the reverse. A special term used in the New Testament to mark the character of the inner life when it is, um, when it, when it is as it should be is dikaiosune. Jesus' account of dikaiosune, or of being a really good person, is given in Matthew 5, 20-48. We need to stop for a moment, that's what we just talked about, the law, we need to stop for, for a comment on the special term that played as large a part in the thought of the classical and Hellenistic Greek world, as well as in the language of the Bible, an early form of Christianity that emerged to conquer the Greco-Roman world in the 2nd and 3rd centuries. In other words, this is what conquered the world. The human needs to know how to live. The human, the human beings need to know how to live as perennial and has never been more desperate than as is today. And he writes this in 2009 in New York or Los Angeles and London. It's, it's especially needed. The search for something deeper had been a serious intellectual and spiritual project in the Mediterranean world in the 5th century B.C. or even earlier. That search is, in fact, found worldwide in scope, but nowhere did it achieve a higher result than in the great prophets of Israel, such as Amos, Micah, and Isaiah. Its first thorough and systematic treatment within the powers of human reason was found in Plato's Republic, which would be more accurately translated, the city. This book is really a study of the human soul and of the condition in which the soul must be found for human beings. And Plato plays a little trick. He's, he says, in order to find this in human beings, we should blow it up like on an enlarger or copy machine to see it. And as is the human being, so is his city. And that's why they blew it up to look at the city and to look at all the different components. But the goal of looking at all of those components was... How can we know how should we be in ourselves? This is exactly the term that Jesus used in the Discourse on the Hill, or the Sermon on the Mount. And it's usually translated justice in Plato's text, but the kaiosune is often translated righteousness in the Bible, but it's the same Greek word. The best translation for dikaiosune would be a paraphrase like, what that is about a person that makes him or her really good and right and shapes their behavior. In short, we might say true inner goodness. Plato, following Socrates, tries to give a precise and full account of this true inner goodness. But in establishing the central term, Aristotle basically says virtue. And virtue sort of word wins the war of words. But now here Jesus uses dikaiosune, righteousness, here in Matthew. It's the engine, the practices, the formation that makes you capable of doing the things that you will be known for. So be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward in heaven. The not even anger, not even lust, not divorcing, non-defensive, non-retaliatory, love your enemies. But now Jesus had a context, and that context was what is technically called Second, Second Temple Judaism, or the first century Judaism that was practiced there. And to become a good Jew, to become a tzaddik, that means a righteous one or a holy one, in Arabic it meant something more like true friend, there were three things that, that good, practicing um, people of God were expected to do. Give alms or money to the poor or money to the temple. Prayer and fasting. And we'll talk about these over the next three weeks. And Jesus treats them here in this order in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, why these three? Well, money is the most fungible communal expression of value that we have. Jesus says, where your money is, there is your heart. The way what you do with your money expresses what you value. Prayer 
is your inner monologue, your, your, your conversations with God, your, your discovery of yourself. That's what happens in prayer. Fasting is about your appetites, food, sex, libido dominandi, epithumia, as we talked about in Peter. So Jesus says, well, in his context, these three things shape your core. And Jesus says this with respect to money and sees this in Luke 21. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he says, this poor widow has put in more than any of the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, putting in all she had to live on. And right away you see, well, you can see a window into the show. Everybody lines up to say, who's giving the most? And everybody is impressed at these large, fat offerings that the wealthy are giving. And ooh, ah, and then one poor woman comes up, gives two pennies, and Jesus says, she gave more. Why? Well, the wealthy already received their reward. And so this is what Jesus says. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do. Well, what's a hypocrite? Well, they're, they're sort of two-faced. They're, they're wanting to give a religious show, but their heart really isn't devoted to God. That's what a hypocrite means. They, they're false. They're duplicitous. They, they can't hold the image they're trying to present in public. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Look at how religious this is. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Jesus doesn't say they don't receive a reward. It's just the thing they were looking for, they got. They were looking for everyone to say, oh, how holy. Oh, how moral. Oh, how enlightened. Oh, how evolved. There's a lot of that going on today. You can see it everywhere. Social media actually fans the flames of our moral performance before the world. I want to be seen as loving to everyone. I want to be seen as giving to the oppressed and the underclassed. I want to be seen as being on the right side of history. And Jesus says, congratulations. There you have it. You have received your reward. And in a secular society... It makes sense that this stuff gets inflated because we don't believe that there is a heavenly judge. We don't believe that there is an eternal reward. We don't believe that anything that we do now counts for life of the age to come and the next life we're going to. It all has to be cashed in now, so you might as well go on Facebook and show everybody just how moral and enlightened and upright and and non-whatever bad thing you think is bad ought to be. Jesus says, there you go. Lots of likes, lots of clicks, lots of applause. Congratulations. Cashed in. Truly I tell you that they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, when you use your money to make the world right, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Here's one of these things that Jesus says that has stuck, and everybody knows what it means. Don't let your left hand know. Do it so surreptitiously that the other parts of your body aren't even aware. So that your giving may be done in secret. In other words, let all your Facebook friends and all your Twitter followers and all the people you share the street with think you don't give anything. You don't do anything. Let them think you're a moral mess. Let them imagine you're a moral misfit. Let them think you are on the wrong side of history. But in secret, give so that only your God knows. Try that. Or at least get as close to that mark as you can. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Hmm. What does that mean? What does that mean for world saving? 
You see, the world is still a mess. 2020 is a lesson in humility. We thought we had everything all under control. We thought we were on the, the gravy train of history, that we have antibiotics and we have air travel and we have democracy and, and we, have, we have moral enlightenment better than all those people that lived 30 or 50 or 100 years ago. All our remedies were exposed as futile. Yet we keep trying the same old, same old. Let's put a new person in charge. They'll fix it. Jesus offers us his path. The most proven game to save the world. This, but his path, is the opposite of what our natural appetites are demanding. You mean give our money without applause? You mean do right when nobody thinks? You mean have our neighbors imagine... We have no moral reputation? Yeah, that's what Jesus says. And actually, that's what Jesus did. Because when he was being crucified, well, only those who are, they imagine that God works sort of like karma. And so if Jesus is meeting a bad end, well, certainly he deserved it. Like Job, there must have been some secret sin. And all of Jesus' rivals and enemies thought, He's getting his comeuppance, that Jesus is immoral. And what's worse, his little group of followers, they're immoral too. On the cross, think about this. This is so often true of Jesus. You think you have him captured, and the image turns, and you're quite, not quite sure. On the cross, was Jesus showing his righteousness? One way you think about it, you say, well, he sort of was, but what eyes would you need to see to recognize it? His disciples were hiding. His mockers were rejoicing. Yet Paul says, only one thing do I need to follow. Christ crucified. And Paul's reputation was garbage. We live before an audience of one. Was Jesus giving in public? They divided what few possessions he had, did he receive praise or mockery? You see, people didn't even use the symbol of the cross until hundreds of years later because it was so shameful. They understood what crosses meant. Do you want to save the world? Good for you. Follow the world saver. Do what he commands. Do as he did. He was the ultimate non-hypocrite. Also, in many ways, the hardest guy to ever figure out. Was he displaying his great gift in public? Yeah, but no one could see it. They couldn't recognize it. But there it was. Be famous for these things. Not even angry. Not even lustful. Not divorcing. Non-defensive. Non-retaliatory. Loving your enemy, but doing so in a way that nobody knows you're doing it. So we start to think about that. It's hard. Living by gratitude. Doing these things. Giving away your money. Fasting. Saying no to your appetites. And devoting yourself to prayer. To go to God. Not, well, I, I know he prays five hours a day. We'll talk about that next week. Don't let them know how much you pray. You don't have to drop it into your language all over the place. If you do, you've already received your reward. But do it silently. Go ahead. Have a bad, repu have a bad reputation. Your Father in Heaven knows, and He's finally the audience that counts.